Okay, uh, so I'll give you an overview now of, uh, so I'm speaking this morning mainly about NeuroConstruct, but uh, I'll give you an overview of this and the first hour or so of the tutorial we have uh, this afternoon. Um, so this morning I'm going to be talking about NeuroConstruct, so as you've heard, it's a graphical application for developing uh, networks of biophysically detailed neurons in with m more of a focus on the three-dimensional structures, whereas um, something like topographic yesterday was uh, more concerned with two-dimensional layers and uh, simulators like NEST are uh, uh, dealing with kind of point neurons uh, which don't necessarily have any three-dimensional structure. Neuroconstruct is focused around uh, trying <coughs> to incorporate as much of the anatomical detail as possible uh, into the construction of the networks. So that's what I'll be talking about for this hour this morning. Uh, I'll also talk about NeuroML, which is a standard uh, language for describing these types of neurons that I've been working on as well for the past number of years. It's not just used by NeuroConstruct, there's a number of other applications out there which will use this language and it covers various things from morphologies, ion channels, networks and so on. So I'll talk a little bit about that this afternoon um, and how that relates to NeuroConstruct and a number of other tools that are out there at the moment. Um, also this afternoon I'll give some examples, uh, so I'll mainly focus on the use of NeuroConstruct this morning, but I'll give some examples of uh, work in progress and work that's already been published, uh, both examples are from the Silver Lab, but using NeuroConstruct, using NeuroML in real, to do real neuroscience as opposed to just developing software and so on. So this is an example of a layer 5 pyramidal cell and, it's and this study is investigating uh, NMDA spikes uh, in layer 5 pyramidal cells and the effect of background uh, excitation on um, the synaptic integration in these types of cells. Uh, another example which has been published is of creating a detailed um, electrically coupled Golgi cell network, uh, Golgi cells in the um, granular cell layer of the cerebellum and this has been two papers come out of this already uh, incorporating a large amount of anatomical, anatomically measured detail, um, electrically uh, measured properties of these cells into a very detailed model of this uh, Golgi cell network of the cerebellum and using NeuroConstruct. And hopefully at the end of the day I'll talk a just briefly about um, a project we're working on at the moment called the Open Source Brain, opensourcebrain.org where uh, we're trying to make it easier for people to build these type of models, to share components, to reuse components, and to kind of collaborate on these very complex models. I mean, no one lab can come up with a very detailed model of the cerebellum or a cortex, even though they may claim to be. Um, but you do need expertise from lots and lots of different labs. So this is an attempt to try and get people to share these models, to work on them together, and to do this in a completely open source uh, kind of manner. Okay, so I uh, will just start off with presentation on NeuroConstruct. Okay, so um, as I've shown already, it's a graphical application. Um, so whereas many of the tools have been developed, uh, very good tools, very useful tools uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, have focused on uh, coming up with a simulator, developing a script perhaps that's native to that simulator, for creating these detailed networks. Uh, NeuroConstruct started off as a, um, to try to create a tool which uh, showed you graphically the type, uh, types of cells, types of networks that are being created and then go about uh, generating the very complex scripts for these specific simulators. So to make it easier for somebody to, s to look at something in, uh, in front of them on the screen and then compare that visually to uh, the systems that they're actually studying and then uh, also be able to make it easier to click around, select a cell, look at the behavior of that and then analyze that um, in the same way as you might analyze if you had the data on uh, the corresponding network uh, from Slice or from in vivo and so on. Uh, so the background to this, it's been developed in the last number of years. It's written in Java, um, but hopefully you don't have to see too much of that. Um, but it's been developed in Angus Silver's lab for the past number of years. I'm one of the main developers in that, but there's a number of other people have contributed to it over the years. And so the key thing is to uh, help you develop three-dimensional uh, network models of biologically realistic cells. So the assumption here is that they are conductance-based cells. It's, you can uh, develop integrate and fire 
uh, and simpler kind of point neurons with this uh, structure, but the focus has always been on um, uh, multi-compartmental conductance-based cells with ion channels with um, incorporating anatomical and physiological detail. Um, and it also allows, because you have the full uh, three-dimensional detail, allows positioning of these cells, uh, hopefully along with the same density, with the same uh, relative position as would be found in uh, cortical structures uh, like neocortex or cerebellum or hippocampus and so on. And it automatically generates a script for these uh, types of simulators. So the current simulators that are supported, neuron and genesis have been the ones which have been supported longer, longest, but Moose that you've heard about as well is also supported, and P6, um, but, and various other ones. Uh, Nest is to a certain extent supported, but only for very simplified models. Um, but different simulators have different uh, capabilities. So, but wh what's very good is the ability to actually compare across these uh, different simulators because the models themselves are very complex. Uh, because there could be something which is simulator specific uh, built into your model. You don't necessarily want that. You want a model which is uh, a model of the physiology which should produce the same behavior independent of what uh, piece of software you've actually run it on. Okay, so it's been around for since 2007, first public release. It, there's a publication on it that's getting old at this stage, uh, but it covers most of the aspects of it. Uh, published in Neuron in uh, 2007, Neuroconstruct. Uh, there's a mailing list, which is fairly low volume, so if you do feel like signing up, it's open source, and anybody can um, download it, edit it, send me feedback, and so on. And we have funding for another couple of years, and we're going to be hopefully getting some more. So it's going to be around for a while, hopefully, and um, supported, and uh, hopefully, as more people get to use it, there'll be more people who can answer questions and so on. OK, so uh, I've got a slide here on getting Neuroconstruct, but thankfully, it's already installed, so you don't have to worry too much about this. But um, there's various binary installers available. Uh, you can get a zip file with the current release that includes all the source code. Uh, you can also, because it's open source, go uh, to and it's open source and it's being uh, distributed under subversion. So you can actually check out the very latest version that I've checked in last night uh, and pull everything you need for it, including NeuroML and so on, and build it locally if you want. But as I say, it's installed already on the uh, machines in the tower, so don't need to worry too much about that. And if you do feel like uh, browsing the source code, uh, hopefully it's arranged in some logical fashion, but uh, I'd advise downloading NetBeans and there is a NetBeans project associated with the um, code and you can browse through it and hopefully get an idea for how it's internally structured but again you don't necessarily need to uh, uh, worry too much about that. So this is just a very quick overview of the overall functionality of the application. Um, so what it involves is uh, Building cells, uh, that these can either be um, detailed, uh, morphologically detailed cells or more abstract morphologies. Adding to these cell models uh, information on ion channels, uh, the location of synapses and so on, creating uh, detailed spiking cells, positioning these um, cells in three dimensions. And once you have a connected uh, network of neurons, exporting them into various different languages like neuron and genesis and so on and then browsing them, the details of those uh, simulations back in the three dimensional, through the three-dimensional interface and analyzing the population behavior and so on. So to hopefully give you a very quick overview of what it will involve, uh, I've got Neuroconstruct here. Hopefully that's reasonably... Well, so it's um, an interface that's organized with various tabs along the top here for but I'll go through those in a little bit more detail. But what I'll just very quickly do is generate a network. Now, this is a network of the uh, cerebellum. So I'll just give you to indicate what I'm trying to generate here. So this is the cerebellar cortex. I don't know if very many people are familiar with the structure of the cerebellum. You don't need to be very familiar with it, but it's, it's basically organized along the lines of uh, at the cerebellar cortex, a number of Purkinje cells, well, there's various different uh, types of input into the um, uh, cerebellar cortex, but the main feature of it is these parallel fibers which intersect this uh, planar dendritic tree of the Purkinje cell um, and a granule cell layer which um, receives its mossy fiber input and 
these granule cells form these parallel fibers and the Purkinje cells are the main output of the uh, cerebellum. So in NeuroConstruct I've defined kind of abstract cells for each of these, well for mainly three main types here. So this is the structure here and what it's basically done is this is the granule cell layer here, these are the parallel fibers and it's specified the general shape of each of these types of cells a kind of abstract representation of the uh, Purkinje cell and specified how many connections between each of these, how many connections here within the granule cell layer and so you can have a look at this and see whether you're happy with the uh, relative uh, connectivity here. So once you've done with that you can select your simulator here whether it's neuron genesis and so on, we'll just generate uh, neuron code. So from that representation, so each one of those cells has details on the ion channels present and the structure and so on. And what it will do here is uh, generate all of the neuron files, neuron specific files for each of these and let you run that simulation in neuron. Hopefully this will pop up. Okay, so this is actually um, neuron running here. Uh, this is the existing three dimensional interface for neuron. Um, and you can see the general spiking pattern each of each of these cells. Uh, you don't necessarily have to plot this while you're actually running, you can run it in the background or run it on a cluster and it can be calculating the behavior of all of these cells. But once it's actually finished, um, here, <coughs> quit. You can load this back into NeuroConstruct. And hopefully replay that. Um, here. So the advantage of loading this in here, you can uh, pause it, you can go to various different places in the simulation, uh, you can zoom in but you can also um, select different cells and plot these and look at the behavior, look at the um, population raster plot of various things here. So there's various different functionality that you can actually analyze uh, once you get it back into NeuroConstruct. Um, but again, this simulation could have been run in Neuron, it could be run in Genesis as well, it could be run in a cluster, or you could run uh, through the Python interface for this. Uh, you needn't even open the uh, graphical interface here. You could run a hundred different uh, permutations of this network here on the simulator and analyze them either through the interface or offline and so on. So that's the very brief introduction to the interface. So I'll give a little bit more detail now on that. Um, any questions at this stage of general, everybody's got the general picture behind it? Okay. Uh, okay, so as I said, um, it's all the main inf uh, interface here is organized into tabs. So uh, you can click on each of these for the different cell types, cell mechanisms, the network and so on. Uh, the general flow uh, is that you start on the left and work right. So you set your project details. Uh, add some cells, add some mechanisms like uh, ion channels and so on, generate the network and then export. Um, and there's other functionality if you click through on these um, menu to um, access the rest of the functionality. And as I say, um, best advice I can do is just create a new project, click on everything you see and see what it does. Uh, it won't erase your hard drive, um, but just play around with it, get a feel for it and maybe uh, there are a number of uh, existing examples included with the uh, standard distribution. So you have uh, any of the examples I show here, you have those there and you can just play around with those, generate some networks and see what it does. Okay, so the first tab here is for the project. It just gives a quick overview of the brief description of the project, um, but it will also list the cells and cell groups uh, that are present. Um, and these here, so for listing these different cell types here, all these are clickable. So once you see an interesting cell here, you can click on that and go to the tab and list the properties of that. Um, and you can also see the date and version that uh, it's previously been stored with. 
Uh, for the cell types, um, this second tab here, that's not very clear, but hopefully you can see there that um, it'll just give a brief overview of the properties of the cell, the specific capacitance, the cell, uh, channel mechanisms present, and so on, and the number of sections and so on. Um, if you want more information on that, you can click on Full Cell Info and then it'll go through, if it's a detailed 3D model, it just gives a brief summary here, but if you click on Full Cell Info, it should give all the information it has on the three-dimensional structure. Uh, what it will also do is, uh, down at the bottom of this, uh, because it can analyze the cell, if it's missing some ion channels, if it's uh, disconnected, if you've loaded in a morphology from a reconstruction and for some reason there's a break in the dendrites, it'll list various different problems that it's found with the cell here. There's also actually a validate button which can just validate all the cells in the project and give you uh, a brief uh, overview of any problems that might come up. Um, and you can also click on this um, button here for viewing it, viewing the morphology in 3D. And then I'll show some examples of later. Um, you can also create uh, copies of cells. So I think one of these is here. Um, Yes, uh, create copy of cell type. So it's, it makes it easier to uh, just take a cell, copy it, remove a channel, uh, modify the cell, remove all the dendrites and see what it does. And uh, yeah, as I say, info on validity of cell. And uh, okay, so what also is at this tab here is uh, add new cell type to project. So at this point here, what you're able to do is click on this and what you what you could import at this stage is various, various different cell types. So there are some structured uh, cell descriptions in Neuron, Genesis and so on, and Neurolucida, which is this uh, software for reconstructing detailed morphologies. Uh, at this, if you click this button here, you'll get options for importing various cell types here. So they can import from a multiple different formats and convert to a Neuroconstruct project and at that stage It'll tell you if there's any problems. It'll probably warn you that there's no channels on the cell. But at that stage, it's in Neuroconstruct, and then you can start uh, exporting to other formats from there. OK, so and there's also help, help functionality available on this. If you click on Help, uh, importing morphology files, you get more information on the types that are there. Yeah? Just a sort of deeper question. How, when, you, when you save the project, is it what format is it in? Does that depend on what simulator you in, or is it in something like URL, which is well, dependent? originally, um, I mean, so all of the pro all of the details like the project description, project name, and so on. What it actually is, I mean, technically speaking, it's Java in the background, and then there's a native Java method for saving those Java classes to. It's actually an XML file, but it's basically a ser serialization of that Java classes. So originally, all of the information was in that uh, serialization of this Java classes. So it was very Neuroconstruct specific, but what it's moving more towards now is saving as much as possible in NeuroML format. So at the moment, the channels are saved in NeuroML, the morphologies can be saved in NeuroML as well, so that when you actually go into the Neuroconstruct project and browse through it, uh, the majority of the interesting stuff that you're finding is in NeuroML. So it's kind of multi, multiple different tools can actually load that up, but once you loaded in Neuroconstruct, it'll, it'll search through those folders, find the channels and so on, and give you the details here internally in uh, extracted from that NeuroML. And you've got backward, backward compatibility with the old Neuroconstruct format. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, yeah, so you get an option for saving the morphologies. I mean, you can actually save the morphologies in Java XML format. You can save it in a kind of binary format, which is very fast to load. Uh, if you have very detailed cells, um, you, it's a little bit slower saving it in XML than loading it back in, so you can save it into this binary format. But I mean, it's completely backward compatible and and so on. Okay, so you probably, I think, Arndt has given you a kind of brief overview of the uh, concept of uh, cable modeling and compartmental modeling. So I mean, if this is a kind of typical neuron, uh, a compartmental representation of this might be this approximation here where you've just measured various points along this and decided that, okay, these are my interesting points here uh, and you want to create a compartmental representation of this. This is the kind of equivalent electrical circuit where you have, well, basically each of these represents uh, an electrical circuit with various different um, conductances for the active membrane conductances, leak conductance and synaptic input and so on, but I won't go into that in too much detail. So, I mean, that's 
the general idea behind these kind of um, approximation of real neurons. Uh, but e the thing is that each of these different uh, tools, like neuron and genesis, have their, s their own slightly different ways of handling uh, these representations. So a lot of them actually are based on neurolucida reconstruction. So hopefully a lot of people have heard of neurolucida. Okay, so it's basically a tool for uh, graphically tracing these neurons and converting uh, confocal stacks images of uh, uh, filled uh, neurons into a kind of 3D representation of these. So you'll go from uh, the original neuron, you'll have uh, Z stack images of this and pick out your interesting points here. So what you'll actually come out with is three dimensional 3D points and radii for each of the locations along the cell here. You might actually just have a uh, rough outline of the cell body. Uh, so, but that representation there is handled in, as I say, slightly different ways by neuron and genesis. Uh, neuron can, uh, has a m much a slightly better uh, functionality for representing these cables along uh, dendrites. Genesis and moose represent everything as a cylindrical um, uh, compartments here. So what basically what NeuroConstruct tries to do is kind of create a superset of all of these representations here to not lose any of the detail when you import this uh, neurolucida rec reconstruction and internally provide mappings onto these uh, simulator specific formats. So it, it knows about the representation in Genesis here. It knows that it has to convert this uh, more detailed dendritic section into a smaller number of compartments for Genesis. It knows that Neuron is happy to handle this, but it just happens to prefer uh, cylindrical somas instead of spherical somas, and so on. So what Neu NeuroConstruct and actually um, uh, NeuroML try to do is try to incorporate all of this information and then for the specific requirements of a simulator, map it onto that and then let the simulator uh, uh, executed in its own particular way. Okay, so um, okay, so once you have your cells, you want to actually define uh, where they're located in three-dimensional space. So this tab region allows you to create a number of three-dimensional regions. So, for example, if you uh, want to simulate the cortex, you might have various layers and uh, put in some approximation for the X, Y, Z. Uh, corners of a rectangular box for each of these layers. Um, now these regions can be used for packing cells in three dimensions, but it can also uh, select within a three-dimensional structure a region where you want to apply electrical input. Uh, you can select a subset of cells using these 3D regions that you want to analyze or plot uh, separately. Um, you can also define, that will say a little bit more about uh, axonal arbor for next network connection. So you can define a 3D uh, volume around a cell where you can, uh, where that cell can find connections, but I'll say a little bit more about that later. And so the three-dimensional um, regions that are supported at the moment are a rectangular box, a sphere, a cone, and a cylinder. Others can potentially be added, but that should be enough to uh, uh, simulate, for the moment, to simulate most uh, types of structure, and there are associated with NeuroConstruct. I'll just show you here, if I shut that down. Um, uh, when you open up NeuroConstruct, you will get a list of examples here. So if you click on load example project, you'll get a list of these examples here. Um, you also have detailed models that um, are the more kind of physiological models like the granule cell and CO1 pyramidal cell, but included in these examples is this one here, example two packing. So when I go through the presentation here, I'll, um, oops. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes, so I'll mention some of these uh, specific examples. So if any of these are interesting for you, you can go later and actually try to generate these and um, uh, look at them yourselves. So, okay, so once you have defined your regions, so you want to define some cell groups or populations. So these will be um, multiple instances of identical cells. So some simulators out there will give you 
uh, the option for generating new morphologies from a class of cells and creating a population of pyramidal cells and so on. Uh, the thing with Neuroconstruct at the moment is that within a cell population, uh, all of the cells are identical. Um, and they're associated with a 3D region. So each of these cell types uh, is, is associated with a specific uh, region, the 3D region that you've created before. You can specify a priority. It's not just the order in which they're placed here. You can specify a prior priority. So if you're packing these in 3D, which ones to create first and then pack around those. Um, there's various options for uh, packing them in three-dimensional space. You can do it randomly. A regular packing in three dimensions, in two dimensions, hexagonal, and give a, a spe specified position for each of the cells. And again, this example um, shows some of those. So this is basically what you can generate here. So there's various options for uh, randomly placing cells in a spherical location or a cone, uh, creating them in a, a cylindrical column. And some of these are the regular packing of cells. So I think this is. Uh, regular packing, and this is kind of cubic close packing where it's slightly greater density. Uh, you can place cells at specific locations and then pack other cells around these. So this, this example uh, just shows you some of the options there. So depending on the particular structure uh, you want to simulate, you can uh, pack them in various different ways. Okay, so that's fine. You have your cell morphologies, you have them placed in three-dimensional space, but you want to actually make them spike. So at this tab, cell mechanism, what you can actually add is uh, active membrane conductance mechanisms, so sodium channels, potassium channels, and so on. Uh, synaptic mechanisms, so uh, the properties of uh, synaptic connections between cells, so AMPA, NMDA, but also um, plastic synapses, like if you want to simulate uh, short-term plasticity or uh, spike timing dependent plasticity but also iron concentration dynamics. Now, I don't know if you've covered in any great detail, but quite a number of these detailed cell models will also include a calcium accumulation mechanism. So for the behavior of a number of cells is highly dependent on uh, the interaction of calcium, which flows in through calcium specific calcium um, permeable ion channels, but that internal calcium also affects other channels which are dependent on the concentration of calcium like SK and BK channels. So through those channels, uh, those are actually permeable to potassium, but it won't just be the membrane, the difference in membrane potential uh, which affects their behavior, but it will also be the internal calcium concentration. So this is one of the very interesting parts of mo uh, these type of um, conductance-based models, getting the balance right between the potassium channels, the calcium uh, currents and so on, and the internal calcium mechanism and the interplay of all of these can be quite, quite complex, but um, you can also, yeah, so basically you can include this type of uh, ion uh, calcium concentration dynamics here in, this in these type of mechanisms here. I'll show a, a brief example of that later as well. Um, so they can be specified in a number of different formats here. Uh, you can have native genesis or even moose scripts for defining the behavior of these, uh, but the preference is for describing them in channel ML. Now, channel ML is part of NeuroML that I've mentioned once or twice, and I'll go into a little bit more detail this afternoon. Um, this is just a uh, the standardized language which uh, you can describe these mechanisms in, in XML. Now, Neuron, Genesis, Moose, even P6 all deal with the same types of channels, uh, sodium channels, potassium channels, and so on. But each of them has had, for a number of years, their own native way for actually specifying these. But none of these are um, anything more than the equations you would see in Hilla or any of these other books uh, describing the properties of ion channels. The physiology behind all of these implementations is identical. So what ChannelML and what NeuroML in general tries to do is to abstract out the physiological properties of these. So if you look in a ChannelML file, you just have the physiological properties of the gates and the rate uh, variables between uh, the different states of the gates. And uh, NeuroML and NeuroConstruct specifically will enable you to map this onto the specific format, the specific Moose file that uh, Moose favors for describing this uh, sodium channel or to the neuron mod file uh, for describing this sodium channel, um, but have it in a simulator independent format. So 
in, in that way, this is the preferred format for storing it in NeuroConstruct, and there's a number of uh, examples out there for these channels converted to that format, and hopefully uh, more and more applications will uh, start supporting these simulator-independent formats. Um, but also, as I say, I mean, if you do have something in a neuron mod file or a Moose-specific file, you can actually use it here. Uh, you'll only be able to map it to that particular simulator, but it might make it easy, well, it should make it easier to eventually start converting it to the uh, simulator independent format. Um, okay, so these channels are independent of any given cell. They can be reused on uh, multiple different cells. Um, it's easy to cut and paste these from one NeuroConstruct project to another by looking in the cell mechanism folder, but I won't go into that in too much detail. Okay, so to give an actual example of um, a cell which is specified, which has its channel specified in this format, this is just a single compartment uh, model. Um, it's actually a cerebellar granule cell, um, and it has, I think, seven different types of channel here. So it has a leak conductance, it has uh, fast sodium channel, it has a number of types of potassium channel. It also has a calcium dependent potassium channel. Um, a calcium channel which uh, allows calcium to flow in, but also this internal exponentially decaying pool of calcium. So calcium comes in through this uh, calcium channel, uh, slowly decays to a resting potential, but the um, uh, transient uh, concentration of calcium influences this uh, potassium channel here. So all of these uh, mechanisms are specified in channel ML and you can see here the behavior of the cell over about a second or so in neuron and genesis matches quite closely. Um, you can run this uh, model later and see in a little bit more detail uh, the different um, uh, properties of e indi the individual ion channels, the uh, behavior of the in internal calcium. But the idea here is that it's a complex model if you have this simulator independent physiological description of the channels and it behaves the same on neuron and genesis, then you can be more confident that it act is actually described in physiology rather than something specific for one particular simulator. Okay, so that was a single compartment cell. You can also specify, so these here are the list of ion channels present in the project, so uh, persistent uh, sodium, um, M-type uh, potassium, these are all listed at the cell type mechanism, but this is actually a visualization of the cell where you're actually specifying in different uh, locations on the cell, on the soma and dendrites, the densities of each of these channels. So this is just an interface that I'll say a little bit more about later, but just to specify that, okay, these individuals uh, channels aren't specific to one particular cell. You could have multiple different cells and distribute it in uh, multiple different ways on these cells, but I'll say a little bit more about that later. Okay, so networks, there's a m number of different options for building networks in NeuroConstruct. This one here is the, um, at the tab, uh, new, uh, network. So this one here is the morphology-based connection. So the idea here is that, um, so as in the earlier example I showed, uh, you can specify the locations on the presynaptic and postsynaptic cells where you want a particular type of connection to be created. So, for example, in this connection here, you say, okay, this uh, parallel fiber and the tips of the dendrites of the uh, Purkinje cell are where I want my connections. You can specify the number of connections between these. Um, you can also specify multiple different types. So again, uh, specified at the cell mechanism uh, tab, you have a description of AMPA and NMDA, which is a voltage dependent um, synaptic mechanism. You specify what types of um, uh, synaptic mechanism you want between these number of uh, cells and so on, and it's a little bit difficult to see there, but it's probably, well, hopefully you saw it early on the earlier example as well, where there are just connections between uh, these parallel fibers and those regions on the um, uh, dendritic tree. So again, you can generate this example later. You have a number of options for the synaptic weights uh, between these. Uh, they could be random, they could be Gaussian values. Um, you can also actually specify an act so, uh, action potential propagation delay uh, where you don't actually simulate uh, all of this uh, structure here. You can just uh, specify that, uh, okay, the action potential is generated in SOMA and it will take a, have a certain speed to get to any particular point on this uh, axon. And so when this network is generated, instead of uh, simulating a compartment for this, a compartment for this here, it will just generate a fixed value 
which uh, corresponds to the time it would take for that action potential to travel to that point there. So it makes it a lot more efficient to uh, simulate, uh, but you can also then uh, incorporate the delay it would take for action potential to propagate down uh, parallel fibers. Uh, a slightly different um, uh, take on generating networks is with this second uh, option here for volume-based connections. So what this uh, actually says is that you specify a region in 3D space around a cell and say, okay, this is where the axon, a diffuse axon, is actually present on this cell type. And I want to uh, only create connections in that region. You specify in the postsynaptic cell where you want your um, postsynaptic connections and then it will actually generate um, only connections within this volume here where it intersects with this uh, region of the postsynaptic cell. And again, you can uh, have various options on uh, numbers of connections and so on, but you can also actually specify a uh, functional uh, expression for the uh, connect connection probability within this volume. So if you want to say that it, it, it's actually a large volume, but it dies off as a kind of Gaussian uh, with a Gaussian probability of connection, you can specify that. And again, you have various different connect, uh, possibilities for numbers of connections pre and post. So there's these two slightly different um, ways of generating these networks, um, but again, they're really based on a three-dimensional representation of um, the structures of pre and post synaptic cells and try to get as much um, information in there as you would actually obtain if you went and looked at the number of connections between different cell types in a layer and uh, in a postsynaptic layer. Okay. Um, okay, so again, included with NeuroConstruct, there's a number of examples here for example 9 synapses and uh, Pine demo where you can have generate different types of networks, different types of synaptic connections. So I think this is an uh, sh example with short-term plasticity and generate these, play around with them, look at the implementations and so on, and try to get a feel for the, um, uh, the possibilities. Okay, so the tab, uh, I'll just go through this briefly. The tab input and output specifies the types of electrical inputs you can apply to your networks. Um, this, for example, uh, allows you to cr add a current clamp input to different cell groups, but also you can apply a Poisson train of uh, synaptic inputs. So if your network is connected up, it's probably not going to do very much by itself. Uh, you want to maybe simulate some background input. So you specify that, okay, this particular cell type receives uh, input at 50 hertz uh, through this particular type of synaptic mechanism, and that will hopefully make one cell group spike and it will propagate through to the rest of the network. Um, you can have various options here for specifying a function uh, for the rate and amplitude. So if you want to apply a, a, a sine wave, uh, uh, either a sine sinusoidally varying current or a different amplitude which varies with a specific um, period, then you can apply these to, uh, through this uh, tab here. Um, at the bottom of this you can save, uh, you specify what values you want to save and plot from your uh, simulation, so you don't necessarily have to save everything, uh, but alternatively you could save every um, compartment in the cell uh, and then visualize the propagation of the action potential through an individual cell, or alternatively just save 10% of the uh, uh, population of the cells. Um, you can, as I say, plot it during uh, the simulation, but that slows it down a lot. Or you can just completely turn off the uh, plotting of this and just save it to file. Um, and lots of things, you can actually, lots of options here for uh, what you want to plot, not just the um, membrane potential, but if you want to get into the uh, rate variables of any of the ion channels, if you want to plot the calcium concentration, the reversal potential of various um, ions and so on. Um, okay. <coughs> okay, so associated with each of these uh, NeuroConstruct projects will be a lot of different cells, a lot of different options for networks, a lot of different options for what uh, stimuli you want to apply. And this concept of simulation configuration is, um, so within one particular project, um, it allows you to specify what sub-elements of the project you want to include when you're generating this. So here, for example, uh, in a uh, cerebellar example, 
you can have, you can select either the 3D network model or you want to just generate a single granule cell, single Golgi cell. So associated with each of these, uh, you get options for which uh, cell groups to include, which network connections to include, which electrical inputs to include and what to plot. So in this way, you can actually hopefully create a series of different uh, configurations. So when somebody else gives it to them, they'll be able to see, okay, I want to generate the large 3D network and the uh, appropriate uh, cell populations and inputs and so on will be uh, generated with that. You can also give them different uh, simulation durations for each of these uh, so that it makes it easier to um, give it to someone else and they'll know what uh, you were intending to generate. Um, one nice scenario would be there's a simulation configuration related to each of the figures in a publication. So if figure, figure one, you have just the single cell properties. Figure two, you have a small network configuration. Figure three, you have the network with a particular cell group knocked out. Uh, you could conceivably have all of these figures up here and then they'd just be able to generate them from there. Okay, so at the tab generate, um, what you would actually do is select one of these simulation configurations and then generate the cell positions and connections on that. Uh, you get a brief summary here of the cell groups, numbers in cell groups and so on that have been generated, numbers of connections generated. <coughs> and so and there's some uh, options here for analyzing numbers of connections and uh, uh, lengths of connections and so on. What you can also do here at this stage is, if it is a very large network, it might take, usually they're just a few seconds to generate. If it does take 10 minutes to generate, what you can do is save it in net network ML. Uh, this can either be in XML format or a binary format here. Uh, and this allows you to generate a network, save it, and come back next day and reload it. And it's much faster to reload it from one of these formats than it is to generate the connections again. Um, the other th option you have is to specify a random seed. So uh, if you have a kind of stochastic connection, if it's randomly placed in 3D, you press the button again, it'll be completely different. But uh, you can also set this uh, random seed so that you know that for a specific random seed, it will regenerate the same network again. If it doesn't take too long, it might be easier just to store these seeds rather than um, uh, the full XML description. Okay, so. At the tab for visualization, there's two options for what you can visualize. You can either visualize a single cell in, in great detail and look at the channels and so on, or you can generate, visualize the 3D generated network. So for uh, the single cells, you have this uh, morphological description where you can see the 3D endpoints. You can look at the various different groups. Uh, I'll just show an example of that for, uh, for specifying the axons and dendrites and so on. You can see where the channels are placed. You can see where different types of synapses are allowed. Um, if you click on a 3D segment, you select that segment and then it gives more details on that segment itself. So say the other option is viewing a generated network. Uh, you can view the 3D location of all the cells and there is an optional for specifying the connectivity. So in the earlier example I showed, um, you can actually see the, uh, physical, the connections between pre and post synaptic locations. If it is a very large network, um, there's also an option for a transparent view where you click on one cell or select one cell or even a group of cells and then everything else can be transparent so that if it is a cortical column model, you can select one or two cell types and make the rest partially transparent so that you can see uh, the positioning of that within the network itself. Um, so there's lots of options if you go to 3D settings in the file menu uh, for uh, options for these, um, uh, how much 3D info, info you want. And you can have a great amount of 3D detail for each of these uh, cells, but it does depend a lot on your video card. If you have a nice uh, graphics card in your machine, then you can set it a lot of detail, but if it's a slightly older machine, you might want to just have a kind of ball and stick representation for your network. Okay. Um, so again, just to show some of the visualization aspects uh, for specifying groups. And, and this is just an example uh, here where you visualize a single cell and you select groups in this drop-down box. Uh, you get the list of groups that are included with this cell. So for example, the axon group, uh, basal dendrites, and so on. Um, you can edit these groups by clicking the button edit groups and select 
which uh, compartments are part of the group, which are outside of the group, and in this way, hopefully, uh, make a more detailed representation of uh, the structure of that. And these, in turn, these groups can be used for specifying ion channels. Uh, so here you've set up your uh, cell, a pyramidal cell here with axon group, dendrite group, and so on. Uh, you have a list of um, the ion channels present, and in this way you can select which ion channels are present in which parts of the cell, and in that way you can uh, investigate properties of having different concentrations of ion channels in the apical dendrites and so on. Um, thankfully, uh, you don't have to do all this through the interface. Uh, there are functions, for example, in Neuron, where if you have an existing model in Neuron with this 3D structure and somebody's optimized their model in Neuron, specified where all the channels are, you can just export all of that from Neuron in NeuronML format, load it up here, and then just visualize it in this way uh, where all of the ion channels are present. Okay, um, and there is also the option of um, conductance density as a function of distance along the cell. So if you open up the example CA1 pyramidal, you can you actually have a function, I think it's one of the uh, uh, H-current, where it uh, varies as a specified function along the cell. So uh, you give the conductance density as a function of R, which would be distance along, distance from the soma. Uh, which is um, a feature of many ion channels in that you no doubt have heard from Matt. Okay, um, so at the tab export, uh, you get a number of options. As shown earlier, you can generate neuron, uh, but there's also options for generating Genesis and Moose and so on. I don't think you're actually going to be able, so in the examples later this afternoon when you're playing with it, I, the preferred simulator will be uh, neuron. I don't think you're going to be able to generate from Moose because that was on a uh, virtual machine, uh, but if you do have a machine with Neuron or with NeuroConstruct and Moose installed on the same operating system, it's uh, quite straightforward to generate for Moose. Um, again, what you're able to do is incorporate blocks of native code. So if you do want something uh, very specific to Neuron, if you have somebody's existing model and they've tweaked a number of things in existing Neuron code, you can add a block of that native code and in, through NeuroConstruct and then the generated neuron script will include that block of code and can adjust your model in that way, but obviously it breaks the simulator independence of uh, neuron, of NeuroConstruct. Um, and ideally, the simulators will be identical on neuron genesis and so on. If they're not, um, and if it's specified in channel ML, it can be very informative about why, uh, well, you'll obviously have to investigate further, but. Uh, it can lead, uh, I've investigated a number of models in these specific formats and um, it can be very informative about where the problem is, whether it's a problem with a simulator or the numerical integration method and so on. As I say, you can export uh, the structure of the network to NeuroML. Uh, there's various options for Neuron, like the variable time step, uh, specifying the random seed. Uh, Genesis, you have options for this compartmentalization, which I won't say too much about, but that was just the mapping of very detailed morphology into a simpler representation for Genesis. Um, in the tab visualization, there is this simulation browser, which, oops, which uh, lists the various different simulations. So if you run a multiple uh, different simulations in Neuron and Moose and so on, you can uh, select uh, the tab visualization, the simulation browser, and it will show you the various different simulations you've run, the simulation times and so on. Click one of these and reload it into NeuroConstruct. Um, there's options for visualization of network activity once you've got it back into NeuroConstruct. So as I showed, plotting voltage at different locations, uh, timing spikes, uh, firing frequency, population raster plots and so on, uh, histogram of uh, cell spiking. So this is just an example which uh, a cortical column model, which I'll say a little bit about later. So plotting individual traces, uh, plotting histograms of um, uh, population spiking. This is just a sum of um, population activity. And these are raster plots of uh, one specific cell group. Um, so there's, as I say, there's various different options with this. This is just a figure from that uh, NeuroConstruct paper where it's visualized some of the other features like uh, creating cross correlations between cells in different regions and showing that these cell, this cell is, uh, has a higher correlation with uh, spiking of other cells in this region compared to 
um, a different region. Okay, um, I'm running a little bit behind, so I won't go into this in great detail. Uh, one of the things actually that um, there's a number of options in the settings, general properties. One thing that uh, we'll have to do later is uh, specify the location of neuron, um, and we have a slide on this for when the tutorial later, but you just have to tell it where neuron is. If it's installed in a standard location, it'll usually find it, but it's uh, slightly different, uh, so you know, need to set that later. Um, various options for logging to screen and logging to file. Um, you have options for what to save it in. As I mentioned earlier, there's various options for XML, binary, and uh, NeuroML. You can set lots of colors, so you can choose a nice pink background if you so desire. And the level of detail for three-dimensional objects, again, depending on your video card and so on, and the level of transparency. Um, I won't go into this too much, but there's options for each of these plot frames when you're visualizing the uh, membrane firing and so on. You have uh, options for saving it, for importing data to compare it to experimental traces. Um, okay. okay, so very briefly, two final things I'll mention. Um, this part of the advanced functionality, it's not actually built into the um, uh, version that's... Actually, no, it is. Uh, so this Python interface can be uh, quite useful if... Okay, it's fine doing things through the graphical interface, clicking on uh, options, changing your channels and so on, but if you want to do that for 100 different values of your um, conductance density, it's going to be, take quite a long time. So once you've built a project in NeuroConstruct, once you've saved it, you can actually access that full functionality in NeuroConstruct behind the scenes using a Python script which loads in the project. You have access to changing any of the properties in there. You have access to generating the um, code for any of the simulators. And you can do this in a nice small script and run hundreds of simulations uh, in that way. Um, it uses Jython, which is a slightly different version, uh, slightly different version of Python, which is implemented in Java, but the majority of the code is identical. Um, and as I say, it can be used for creating scripts which access the, this core functionality from a script without loading up the graphical interface. Um, it can be launched in this way, but if anybody does have any questions, I can show them later. Um, and I won't go through this in any great detail, but this is just a typical script. And all of these functions here for loading the project, naming the given name of the project, setting the number of cells, uh, gen generating this script in NeuroConstruct, setting the random seed, generating the Genesis files, all of these are the functionality that I just showed through the interface there, but just accessed in a script in this way. So if you wanted to run 100 of these simulations, just put in a for loop, generate the Genesis files 100 times, and you get the uh, uh, files back. They're just text files, basically, with membrane potential and so on. And you can do any other functionality here to analyze these scripts and so on, uh, and generate an FI curve or do whatever else. But the key thing here is that all this functionality that you've shown through the interface can be accessed uh, in a nice little script. Uh, some scenarios for this, as I say, generating the input, generating a FI curve for the uh, behavior of a cell under different input currents. Uh, testing robustness of parameters, adjusting everything by 5% and seeing if it still behaves similarly. Um, tuning a uh, model to experimental data. You could implement a mechanism where uh, you have your experimental data, you have your model, uh, you adjust the variables, as Astrid, I'm sure, will be talking about. Um, uh, so basically trying to get your model to reproduce with a specific set of channels to reproduce your experimental data. Uh, generating populations of models, if it's stochastic, if it's a stochastic input, you don't just want to analyze one instance of the cell, you want to in, uh, analyze multiple instances of the population. And just using a subset of NeuroConstruct functionality, so you could potentially uh, have a script which loads in a neuron file, uh, saves that as NeuroML, and does that for 100 different neuron files. So if you just want to access one small part of the functionality, you could have a Python script which does lots and lots of things, but just calls in NeuroConstruct at one point, does one specific task, and then gets on with the rest of its uh, uh, functionality. So the, the idea there is that uh, the good thing with Python, there's lots of different libraries, lots of different tools. Neuron, uh, NeuroConstruct can then just be one more module which you incorporate into your um, tool chain. Okay, so this is just an example of um, the cortical column model I showed earlier, has multiple different cell types, 
and this is uh, FI curves which have been generated for different input currents and this is the firing frequency of each of these different cell types and this was just generated with one Python script from that NeuroConstruct project and you can see various dodgy things about uh, spontaneously active uh, interneurons and things like this from that uh, interface there but as I say you could generate all this through the GUI with individual um, changing the values for the currents and so on but it's much easier with a nice Python script. Okay, and there is um, more detail on the NeuroConstruct website. If you go to, I think, um, contents here, you'll get a link for uh, um, examples of Python scripts in NeuroConstruct. Okay, so the one other piece of advanced functionality that I want to mention very briefly is uh, you haven't had an introduction to uh, Neuron, but I don't know, has anybody, have very many people actually used Neuron in the past? One or two. Um, one of the very good things about Neuron is that it can be uh, generated across parallel um, uh, computing resources uh, so that not just on one simulator, if you have a supercomputer with a few hundred or a few thousand uh, processors, you can uh, run, split up your cell model or split up your network model, run cells on each of those processors and generate very large networks in that way. And it's actually what the Blue Brain project, uh, one of the main simulators that they're using is parallel Neuron. And, Thankfully, it's freely available to anybody who wants to download Neuron. Um, so what NeuroConstruct can do now is, and I won't go into this in great detail, but it's a bit of detail is uh, in the slides here. Um, it can generate uh, transparently code for parallel Neuron. You just tell it, okay, I have eight processors. My machine is located here. And in the same way, you just press generate code for Neuron, and it will behind the scenes, allocate your cells to those different eight processors, zip up your files, send it to the remote um, compute resource, uh, start up parallel neuron there, save the results, bring it back, uh, and you can analyze it through the interface in exactly the same way as if you ran it serially locally. Um, there's some details there. Use with caution. We've had a few publications using this functionality, and we are happy to use it, but it's um, it is useful to actually know the structure behind the scenes, what it's actually doing, so you can generate very large networks, but it's also easy to generate very large networks which are completely meaningless, but if you do want to do this, get in contact, I'll happily give lots more detail. But um, yeah, I, again, I won't go through that in great detail. One of the things there is that some information on how it's actually zipped up and sent to remote uh, um, processes and brought back. But this is just some of the results here with uh, parallel neurons. So this actually is the, I think it is the same granule cell layer model that I showed earlier, but with a realistic cell density. So I think this is 100 microns by 100 microns and so, but each of these cell types here is at the anatomically realistic density. Um, and so it's a fairly simple network, but it's just very large numbers of cells. So what you can see here is that uh, with 10,000 cells and 50,000 cells, as you increase the number of processors, the simulation time goes down linearly. So this kind of indicates that um, if you double the number of processors you're using, <coughs> you'll have the simulation time. We've tested this up to about 200 processors. Uh, we've also tested uh, having a, the same number of cells per processor. So 500 of these single compartment cell, or 5,000 of these single compartment cells per processors up to uh, 200 processors. So we've run a, a simulation with a million cells here and it's staying uh, quite uh, steady here. So it takes the same amount of simulation time if you have two, 200 processors as you would for eight processors with a corresponding number of cells. Um, and this again is that cortical column which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And similarly here for slightly low numbers of cells, but each of these is a multi-compartmental cell model. Uh, it's also quite linear up to about 200 or so uh, processors. And if you scale your network for 50 cells per processor, you can get up to a cortical column with about 10,000 cells, which is approaching, well, if you believe in cortical columns here, uh, the uh, number of cells in a real cortical column. Um, and again, this is staying quite constant here. So all of this code is generated through NeuroConstruct um, and simulated completely transparently to the user um, in a remote cluster, pulls back the results, and then you can analyze. I don't think you can actually view uh, 10,000 cells, but you can definitely get back the 
um, uh, amount of detail, the uh, spike times or uh, membrane potential traces from each of these cells that you specify. And the Python scripts, for example, make this uh, much easier to manage and just scaling up and down the number of cells in each of these uh, populations. OK, so that's pretty much it. Um, Welcome Trust and previously um, Medical Research Council are funders for these, and these are some of the various people who've contributed to this. Uh, a number of people in the NeuroML community, and as I say, I'll say a little bit more about NeuroML later, and some of the projects, uh, yeah, in the afternoon, some of the projects that uh, we've actually used NeuroConstruct for, and then briefly about the open source brain, where we're trying to get lots more input on the specific models from various different people about these. Okay, thanks.